I now invite the very Reverend Ted Suppersfield up to bring us the message this morning. I may, some of the things I've said this morning I may never get asked again. <laughs> Probably the very irreverent. Well, good morning. Now, have we got the PowerPoint uh, working? It's a we don't, we have. Well, good morning. Our text this morning is uh, from the passage. For in him we live and move and have our being. Now, Pastor Aaron has asked me to uh, preach this morning from chapter 17 of, uh, of the book of Acts with Paul is in Athens and try to bring out uh, some of what I have been uh, writing about. Now this message is in two parts. The first looks at the history behind uh, Paul's encounter with the philosophers, and the second is uh, how it's applied to that community. Different to ours, but as we'll see, some very frightening similarities. In the year 51 or 52, the Apostle Paul had to flee from Berea for his own safety and the brothers escorted him to Athens. Now by the time of the New Testament, Athens was a small, quiet city, perhaps 20 to 25,000 people, it was no longer a player in the world political stage and it was still, though, a centre for culture and arts and a university town. Now, Paul was well acquainted with paganism. He grew up in it. But what he saw in Athens was at a different level entirely, which disturbed him and set the scene for the arguments against idols and the foolishness of the wise. When he debated in the Agora, he could see the 400-year-old Parthenon with its 12-metre statue of Athena. There were at least 12, sta 12 uh, temples to different gods in the city, let alone statues and shrines to lesser ones. Pliny reported that there were as many as 3,000 statues in Athens and some would have been to gods. So pervasive was polytheism there that there was a proverb. The gods walk abroad so commonly in our streets that it's easier to meet a god than a man. As he walked around the city, Paul saw something that surprised him, an altar to an unknown God. An altar to an unknown God. Presinius, a second century uh, mythographer and travel writer, wrote of altars to unknown gods in Greece. Now that's gods plural. But here it is, God singular. Now cast your mind back to the Peloponnesian Wars from 431 to 404 BC. Well, maybe none of us are quite that old, but uh, it might be a bit hard to do. But this is where Paul's message to the philosophers started. The Peloponnesian War was fought between city-states aligned to Sparta and those aligned to Athens. Back then, Athens was a very rich and powerful city with colonies right through the Mediterranean. For some reason or other, those two cities fought what was probably one of the biggest wars in history up to that time. Athens had a very strong navy. They had what appeared to be a brilliant strategy. They just built a wall around the city, down to the port of Piraeus, packed everybody from the country inside and supplied the city 
from the colonies. All they had to do was wait out the Spartans who were strong on land who would eventually give up and go home. During the second year of the Peloponnesian War, that's 430 BC, Athens appeared to be winning until a plague broke out. It was so severe that nobody had ever seen the likes of it. The disease showed no regard to a person's piety towards the gods or their temples. And those temples were where people from the countrysides were packed for safety. But they had now become places of special misery instead of refuge. That plague is estimated to have killed somewhere between 75,000 to 100,000 people or 25% of the then overcrowded population. They died like sheep, as one writer said. The residents sacrificed to every god they knew, but the plague did not abate. The idols of wood and stone and metal could not hear and did not hear. The constant funeral pyres caused the Trojans to withdraw and the Athenians' trust in their gods was shaken. And why wouldn't it be? They then sent for Epimenides, a philosopher and a poet in Crete, to advise on how to cleanse and to placate the gods. Dionysus, a Greek historian, writing sometime after this, uh, tells the story. He took sheep, some black, some white, and brought them to the Areopagus. And he let them go whether they pleased instructing those who followed them to mark the spot where each sheep lay down and offer a sacrifice to the local divinity. And thus it is said the plague was stayed. Hence, even to this day, altars may be found in different parts of Attica with no name inscribed upon them, which are memorials to this atonement. with his heart deeply troubled by what he saw and pondering the altar to an unknown God, Paul did what he always did. He preached the gospel. He proclaimed Jesus and the resurrection to all who would listen, to Jews, to worshippers of the classical Greek gods and to the philosophers, the whole spectrum of society and classes. Athens had a long history of their philosophers speaking in the Agora. Like the father of Greek philosophy, Socrates, and he got an easy audience as the wise men had itching ears for the latest ideas. But it was an uphill battle. as the Athenians thought that not only were they superior in their intellect, but they also thought that they were superior in their birth. All other men were barbarians. Their myths taught them that they had always lived in that region, which was known as Attica, and that they had sprung from the soil. They even had a name for it, which I won't even try to pronounce. And they wouldn't mingle the blood of an Athenian with any of the settlers. The least born Athenian citizen was more noble than the richest foreigner. If Paul was wondering how to reach such a religious and arrogant and proud city, the matter was taken out of his hands when the leading Stoic and Epicurean philosophers demanded to hear 
more of these new gods, Jesus and resurrection from this seed picker. They had no idea. Luke confirms the stereotype of the Athenians having itching ears. One old Athenian general wrote, no men are better dupes. Sooner deceived by novel notions or slower to follow proven advice, you despise what is familiar while you are worshippers of every new extravagance. However, the curiosity of the philosophers was not the same thing as openness to the gospel, as Athens had a long history of antagonism against foreign uh, gods and killing their messengers. So that's what's behind the events that led to Paul debating with the philosophers. So let's try and understand his message. Paul was facing professional teachers of the two philosophies that dominated the ancient world, Epicurean and Stoic. I had a picture up earlier of the Stoa. They met in the Stoa, which is why they're called Stoics, both of which had originated in Athens. Now, before we say this is more ancient history, we need to understand that little has changed in our society, they are still the two largest philosophies we will encounter, but under different names. What's more, the world has not come up with any better alternatives. So what were the Epicureans saying? If God exists, he's irrelevant. It's all random chance. They even had a theory of evolution. There's no one out there to call on for help. Live the life here that gives you the maximum pleasure because when you're dead, you're dead. As for the Stoics, there's probably something out there and very occasionally, whatever it is, does intervene, but again, when you're dead, you're all but dead. Your individually, individuality has ended and you just merge back into that cosmic consciousness, that force, which they call the Logos. But what it does mean is that they believe there is something of the divine in us. There are many similarities to the force in Star Wars. It gives the divine a nod, but again, for all intents and purposes, when you're dead, you're dead. Ancient or modern, if we were to ask those who, from the West, why they're not in a house of worship today, it's a fair bet it would come down to some variation of these two old philosophies. Luther described it well, and I reason is the devil's greatest, and I can't reuse the word here because there are tender young ears, but it's not very nice. That is reason that is not in submission to God's revelation. It promises everything, but delivers nothing. So what Paul said back to them then is likely what he would say to the wise today. So the scene has turned back to that same Areopagus where Epimenides let the sheep loose to find the unknown God. Speaking to philosophers who thought they were the wisest of men and that all others were barbarians, Paul quoted back to them that same stoic Epimenides, 
words that just happen to be my favourite Bible verse. For in him we live and move and have our being. And he reminded them of the largely forgotten but still unknown God that he pointed them to. This unknown God was more powerful than all their idols that they'd sacrificed to. And the philosophers still did this for various reasons. And despite being unknown, had compassion on them when they were without hope yet they still did not seek to know him. To these philosophers, the truth was less important than intellectual novelty. If Christianity did attract them, it would only be for an hour until the next new philosophy came along. No change there for many. Now, years ago, I had to write an essay on the views of Anthony Flew, a a leading philosopher uh, and atheist at the time. He was a man who would be scathing in his criticism of people like you and me. Sometime after, I read an interview in Christianity Today where he told how he he was no longer an atheist. He had looked honestly at the argument for design in the universe and found it too strong. The psalmist, perhaps when he was just a humble shepherd, far from a learned philosopher and professor, looked to the same heavens and said, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hand. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they have no words, no sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In a similar way, Paul preached to the pagans in Lystra, the backwater of the empire, about the true God, stating that even they should know him. Yet he has not left us without a testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain and heaven and crops in their season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your heart with joy. Paul points to the wise in Athens and say, you are without excuse. If, as you groped like blind men, trying to find the truth, and you had followed the insights you were given to their logical conclusions, you would have seen the foolishness of your idols and your philosophies. Paul would also quote uh, another stoic philosopher, Aratus. We are his offspring. The Stoics at least had come to understand that there was this spark of the divine in us. If we creatures had sprung from the creator, there can't be less of what we possess in God. They know that we can understand something of God by looking at ourselves. We are rational, so God must be rational. We hear and see, so God must be able to hear and see. But they did not make the one connection from our humanity that was necessary. And that is that we are personal. And that if we are personal, then our creator is personal. He wants us to know us and us him. If we are indeed God's offspring, as your philosophers say, what father would gladly cast a son or a daughter aside? If you had acknowledged your ignorance, instead of boasting in your knowledge and sought the unknown God and reached out for him, you would have found him. You would have found that God was not distant, 
nor disinterested, for he is nearby. You live and move and have your being in him. Now surely this is our experience. Unknown is not the same thing as unknowable. How can our God who created the universe and controls the destiny of men possibly be contained in a building made of stone? No matter how beautiful that building was, and they were beautiful, how can an idol of stone or metal be divine when mankind himself contains his image? In the ancient uh, Near East literature, the gods can be seen as portrayed as swarming like flies around the sacrifices offered by men. But we know, as one commentator said, he does not sell his love or his forgiveness to us spiritually bankrupt sinners. Nor can we buy his salvation. It is self-evident. If our creator has to and does give us everything, we have nothing of our own selves to satisfy any of his needs, even if he had any. As for the pride in their citizenship, and uniqueness. Paul, without mentioning Genesis, because that would have been pointless, but still anchoring his words in it, said, rather he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. This means that God is not a foreigner in any part of his universe. No group could regard God as their own special property or claim that he is not suited to their own nationality or culture. He made them all. He maintained them all and he judges them all. Paul said that there are cultural differences and this ought to be seen as the will of God who loves variety. But those differences are no excuse for different ways of thinking about him. The Lord was only alien to their way of thinking. You can't say that it's good for the Jews to be monotheistic because that's their culture. And for the Athenians or the Hindus now to be polytheistic because that's their culture. Beneath all of this, there is a basic unity because God has created all and made mankind from one common ancestor. In a society which said, when you're dead, you're dead, Paul drove home what is the core of the Christian gospel. When you are dead, you are judged. The philosophers had no place for justice, and God knows there's very precious little of it in this world. How could there be if you cease to exist? Grin and bear it, for you'll soon be dead. And more than judgment and justice, there is a resurrection of the just to eternal life and the unjust to eternal punishment and separation from the one who was so close, so close that they only had to reach out. How can we know this? Because of the resurrection of one man. Paul does not say that he was a Jew or a very special Jew, Rather, that Jesus was a man, a human. And the resurrection of one man has implications across every race and nation and language and culture simply because he and they are human. 
Paul spoke about God overlooking their foolishness in times past. But these days have passed, and there is now an urgency to call the people of every nation to repentance. An urgency that didn't exist in previous centuries. In spite of their sin and culpable ignorance, God did not judge the Athenians or the world. When eventually God did send his son, even then it was not as a judge, but as a saviour. But that's not the end of the story. This man, Jesus, is returning not as saviour, but as judge. And not only is it certain, but it is very near. And because of that, God commands everyone everywhere to repent. The clock is ticking. The philosophers were so certain that they were correct, that they ridiculed the message of repentance and judgment and of, res and of uh, resurrection. They also called Paul a seed picker, picking up ideas here and there like a bird without understanding what he was saying. But Luke shows that the wise were the fools and the seed pickers. Have things changed over almost 2,000 years? In many ways, very little. Other than that our Lord's return is much closer and that the days of ignorance will not be overlooked. There's a lot more I wanted to say and I've spoken longer than I normally do. May I just conclude briefly? For we are the ones who have reached out and known God. To us, the Apostle Peter, after telling the story of the fiery end of this world, and with that the foolishness of the wise, advised the saints. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. Concluding prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, I do thank you that when we die, we don't cease to exist, but we will stand before you and behold your glory. Lord, show us more of your face and your love in this world. Prepare us for the next. And Lord, may your gospel go out with power throughout this whole world and draw many, because Lord, the day of your coming, it will soon be upon us. Amen.